just got to keep inviting people to the house of God. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 24 is where I want to take my text from this morning. Matthew chapter 24, I'm going to start reading at verse number 4, and then I want to read down through verse 14, and then read, uh, skip down to 23 and read 23 through 26. Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is speaking in our text today. Matthew chapter 24, verse number 4, the Bible says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, everybody say his name, name. saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. And these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached into all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Verse 23, the Bible says, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. I want to preach to you. The Bible says there's two things in our scripture text uh, that will deceive us. Number one, uh, those that come saying that I'm Christ. And number two, it speaks of false prophets. Um, I believe these are two different things. I believe... Uh, those that are coming saying in my name, saying I'm Christ, speaks of an attitude. Uh, and it's perpetuated by false prophets. But I want to preach to you this morning, and I've titled my message, Exposing the New Jesus. Exposing the New Jesus. I, my intent this morning is to expose him and let you know how to recognize this false Christ that's coming saying that he is the Christ. Can we lift our hands one more time and love the Lord Jesus? We love you. We're so thankful today for your love and mercy. God, I so desperately need the anointing of the Holy Ghost this morning. God, I ask you to anoint the ears of the listeners that we might hear and receive the word of God. God, anoint your servant this morning that I might speak the word as you've given it to me. In the name of Jesus Christ, God, great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness today, Lord. From generation to generation, we will praise and exalt your name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We love and magnify you today. (coughs) Praise the name of the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. I know that you probably look at Pastor and think he knows everything. Uh, Well, I will be the first to admit to you, I, I don't know everything. There are several passages of the Word of God that I, I struggle with understanding, understanding the Word of God. And you said, Brother Hopkins, it seems to be as a minister of the gospel, every time you read a portion of Scripture, the Lord ought to illuminate it and understand it and, and just know what He's talking about. Well, I wish that was the case, but uh, it's not happening to me. I, I, there's a lot of Scriptures that I understand. Uh, And for many years, I had trouble understanding what Jesus meant by this single statement uh, when he said, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Uh, And as as I begin to watch end-time events unfolding before our eyes and and the things that are going on in our world, uh, some scriptures begin to come to light when we go through certain situations in life. 
uh, end time prophecies become more clear when we are seeing end time prophecy being fulfilled. We begin to understand uh, in light of the Word of God. Uh, and as I watch end time events, I have seen this scripture probably being fulfilled uh, by much of the modern religious world. Now understand when Jesus was speaking, he was not speaking to the world or the philosophy of the world or even uh, to those that were in already in false doctrine. He was talking to those that had the gospel of Jesus Christ, the, what we would call the church of Jesus Christ. Uh, so I have trouble with that, and, and, but I'm, I'm, I'm looking at these scriptures through the, the prism of end-time prophecy and end-time events unfolding and, and understand this morning that I'm speaking from the purest intent of my heart this morning. I don't have any ill will as I preach today. I'm not coming to you this morning with a spirit of condemnation uh, I am not coming and approaching this message this morning with an attitude of judgment, uh, but I come to you this morning with an understanding that each generation is going to be different. Uh, you've heard pastors say it before. I'll say it again today that uh, I preach understanding with this understanding that the generation that is coming up after me is not going to live as strict or as, as close to what I preach as I do. Uh, they're not going to do that, and I understand that, and I understand not just the younger generation, that uh, people generally will not fully comprehend and fully live by what I preach, and, and you got to understand that. So maybe perhaps that's the reason, the drive behind the way that I preach, uh, hoping to bring you to the place where you can meet Jesus one day and and that is the reason we're all here. That is the reason why I preach. I'm trying to prepare you for the coming of Jesus Christ. But I come to you this morning to issue a warning about a new Christ that is amongst us, a new Jesus, a new philosophy. And, and, and I, my intent today is to expose to you what he looks like and, and how to recognize him and to understand that. I fear today that while we concern ourselves with who the Antichrist will be, we are seeing the appearance of another Christ that is entering through the back door of our churches today. Uh, coming in unawares and we don't realize maybe it starts out as a, a good idea or maybe a, a, a proper or a new way of doing things and and what we're doing is we're bringing in another Christ and we're welcoming them into our congregation and understanding or without the understanding of the intent behind this new Christ. Stay with me this morning. Uh, one of the duties of ministry, one of the duties of being a pastor is to be able to, to span the gap from one generation to another, to marry the older generation with or attach them with the younger generation and, and, and to mold it to where we can coexist in the same building. And, and it's difficult. I remember years ago as I was a teenager and, and, and there was a transition in our household from the primitive quartet to the Hensons or uh, from the inspirations to the Imperials. And it's a different song style, a different genre of music and different genre, genre of singing and, and ministry through music. Uh, there was a struggle there, I must admit to you, uh, between the older generation, my parents, and the younger generation. And, and they couldn't understand from where I was coming from. But uh, understand this morning that uh, we've got to join together. I have instructed those that lead worship uh, to try to uh, use the more modern music within reason and the older songs in order to uh, not uh, eliminate or isolate the older generation while also, also not isolating the younger generation. But it's our duty, it is my duty to span generation to generation. But what I feel in my spirit this morning is not about a different generation. It's not about old generation versus new generation. It's not about how we 
present the gospel in a different way and I believe and I, I want to have ideas of how to more effectively present the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it's more this morning than just the new music or the new worship songs that is prevalent in our church houses today. Stay with me. I feel the enemy fighting the word this morning. I remember several years ago now being in a conference setting conference service and there was a prominent preacher preaching under the anointing of the Holy Ghost and the crowd was being moved by the the anointing of the Holy Ghost and and I likewise was being moved by the Holy Ghost and he was preaching on the subject what I'm preaching on today more or less about the new music and, and the new singing and the loudness and all of that and nobody understands music and loves music like pastor loves music. Loud music, my wife gets upset with me because when I sit and listen to music, I want to sound like I'm on the front row of a concert, sitting right in front of a speaker. Hallelujah. That's the way I like it. My wife tells me I'm hard of hearing, and I'm not hard in here, and I just like things loud. <coughs> but I heard this prominent preacher preaching and and he said something that has never, I, I don't know anything that he preached about that night, cannot remember any of it, but this one thing that he said, and it is burned in my brain, it's burned in my memory forever. And he said about the music and the sound and the, the music being louder than the, the singing, he said, it doesn't matter to me if I can understand what they're singing or not. He said, all that is important is that we can still dance before the Lord. If that is true, then it would seem logic this morning that it doesn't matter or not whether or not I hear what the preacher is saying. As long as I can feel like a Christian, that's all that's important. Hello. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse number 8, the Bible says, For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, or you don't recognize what the sound of the trumpet is, who shall prepare himself to the battle? I want to be distinctly clear when I preach to you the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want you to understand what I'm saying. When I sing, I sing ministry to the people. I want you to understand the words that I'm saying because if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, we will not be ready for the battle that we're going to fight tomorrow. Now understand, I'm not picking on the younger generation today. I've seen them come and I've seen people go and I've seen generations pass in my lifetime. But I fear this morning that we're witnessing a generation that knows very little about the cross of Jesus Christ and the blood that was shed on Calvary's cross. Uh, amen. I want you to understand, though we move from the primitive to the Hensons and from the inspirations to the Imperials, there was a theme that resonated in both generations that I'm preaching about today, and that was they sung about the cross of Jesus Christ. They sung about the blood, the redeeming, saving blood of Jesus Christ. And listen to me this morning, friend. If we don't sing about it and if we don't preach about it, we will know nothing about it. That's right. Hallelujah. But if you think that the older generation is guiltless, let me preach a little while to you this morning. Amen. I showed Brother Rick just a few weeks ago a scripture that the Lord had pierced my heart with. And, and sometimes as older people and older saints, we feel as though the Holy Ghost has to move in, a, in the way that it's moved for years or the things that we've done for years, we got to continue to do them. But let me tell you, we only cripple the effectiveness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nobody loves the songs that we sing and have sung for years, but I want you to understand if you think for one minute that's the only way that the presence of God can move, we're sadly mistaken and we're crippling the effectiveness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you want me to back it up with scripture, let me read to you Mark chapter 7 verse 13. Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition 
which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. Amen. We make the word of God. The preacher can get up under the anointing of the Holy Ghost and preach hellfire and brimstone, but if we're stuck with the traditions of the uh, of our of our ancestors and our traditions that we've made he can preach like a canary under the anointing of the holy ghost and you can see the anointing oil drip off of his chin but i'm here to tell you it will be preached none effective because of our traditions a church that is stuck in their tradition is a dying church hello In our text this morning, Jesus was prophesying about a shift. Not a paradigm shift in the world or about the world, but a paradigm shift dealing with the church, dealing with believers like you and I. And in his prophecy, he begins to call out false prophets and false religious movements that would use his name. They would come in his name. They would preach his name, they would confess faith in his name, they would pray in his name, they would cast out devils in his name, they would do many mighty works in his name. The Bible says that in comes a day that we will stand before him and say, Lord, have we not prophesied, have we not cast out devils in your name? And he will say unto them, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, I never knew you. It is very possible, saints of God, for those or the, there be people that confess and call on the name of Jesus Christ. And yea, according to Bible prophecy, there come a time when they'll be able to call fire down from heaven. Hallelujah. But the Bible says that they would all that they're doing would be to a different Christ. Saying, I am Christ. And their intent, their purpose is to deceive many. I believe this morning that the ultimate deception will be by men and women that actually say Jesus is the Christ, but do so only in name and not in reality. This new Jesus has the same name. He's preached in the same manner. He is promoted more than the old one per se, but he's promoted with the same great Bible verses. They'll use the scriptures that you and I use But this new Christ will bear no recognition to the historic message of Jesus Christ and him crucified. I want you to understand maybe I'm getting old school. Maybe I'm getting old fashioned. Maybe I'm becoming an old fogey. But just hear the words of the message this morning before you pass judgment on pastor today. I want you to understand the cross-centered life where the flesh is crucified and this life of ours is denied, has no place in this new Christ religion or this new Christianity of today. Matter of fact, the Christianity of today has become more like Hollywood than anything else. It should come to no surprise to you when men that call themselves called of God fall into sin and their sin is revealed. It should not be of any surprise to you that some churches and their pastors and preachers live extravagant lifestyles, living in very uh, wealthy neighborhoods, living in, uh, in expensive homes, driving expensive cars, wearing expensive clothes. And I'm not preaching on clotheslines today, but it should not surprise us because it is a religion that is patterned after Hollywood. But the Jesus of the Bible would totally be repulsed by this new Christ. I believe the Jesus of the Bible would be totally repulsed of this worldly hype that we've given him, the godless singers and all the fanfare that is in the heart of today's church. If Jesus marched into the temple in the day and drove the money changers out with a whip because they were selling sacrifices, amen, and trying to modernize the old church, if he drove them out, could you imagine what he would reaction would be if he walked into some churches today. Hallelujah. He would walk into 
these unholy temples. And I wish I could tell you at this point that this church is a perfect church. I'm talking about this local assembly, but we're not. There's a lot of things that goes on amongst us, attitudes and spirits and traditions that, that would repulse Jesus. And I can say that because I'm pastor. Hallelujah. We're striving for perfection. We are trying. We're good people trying to be like Jesus, but we're not perfect people. But Jesus would march into the modern churches. He would, he would march into some of these, uh, these false doctrines and false prophets. Man, and he would call them vipers and he would call them hypocrites and he would call them whited sepulchers. And, and I promise you today there are many Christians that call themselves Christians that would hate Jesus today just as the Pharisees hated him back in the day. Pastor's preaching this morning. Just keep your seat belts fastened and keep your arms and legs in the vehicle at all times. I want to look at some clear differences between the Son of God, the Son of God Himself in this new Christ of today's deception. Understand when this new Christ has come, He will have a new doctrine. The Bible says that they will preach a gospel which is not another gospel. He will have a gospel that won't sound like the original gospel of Jesus Christ. Along, and if he has a new gospel, I promise you he'll have new music. Hello? He will not look the same. He'll not talk the same. He will not walk the same or sound the same as the old Jesus. His doctrine will try to stimulate the desires of the flesh rather than convict the flesh of its wrong. There is an absence of conviction in our church houses today. God, if we have anything in the house left, let it be the convicting power of the Holy Ghost that when a sinner walks amongst us, it's not that I don't want them to feel comfortable, but I want them to understand that they need saving. They need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. I can't convince them of that. I need the conviction power of the Holy Ghost to be in the house. This new Christ, this new Jesus is a doctrine that wants to make people wealthy. His, this doctrine is to provide you with extravagant lifestyles. Just name it and claim it. Just blab it and grab it, and everything is going to be nice and rosy. Every time you get your paycheck, you're going to have a bonus or you're going to have a raise. Your car's just going to get newer and not older. Your house is always going to be upgraded. I want you to understand the crucified Jesus said, Unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And again he said, if thou wilt be perfect, go sell that which thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasures in heaven, and come follow me. The old Jesus preaches a lifestyle of self-denial. He meant something that we have to crucify ourselves. Paul said, I die daily. Jesus never propagated the doc doctrine of name it and claim it. He never told his disciples, all you got to do is follow me and you don't have to worry about checking your bank account. There's always going to be money there. But what he did say is if you're going to follow me, you've got to hate your father. You've got to hate your mother. You've got to hate your brother. You've got to hate your sister. He's not talking about family love. He's got to, what he's talking about is you've got to understand that if you're going to follow me, it's going to be all about me. Hallelujah. The new Jesus says indulge yourself. Pamper yourself. You've earned it. But Jesus says, humble yourself before the Lord. Whosoever thus shall humble themselves as a little child, the same as the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. He said again, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Hallelujah. This new Jesus preaches a new law, which is a law of self-esteem. We have more and more 
uh, psychologists filling pulpits than we do preachers of the gospel. Hello, if you want me to preach you a feel-good message, I can't do that because I'm not a psychologist. I'm a, a man of God. Hallelujah. I think the only way that we can feel better about ourselves is to be full of the Holy Ghost. Hello, Amen. If you want to feel good about yourself, if you're tired of feeling down and out and depressed, I want you to understand the answer to your problem is repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. Because all things pass away and all things become new after that you receive the Holy Ghost. I'm not going to preach to you seven steps to wealth. I can't preach to you seven steps of self-esteem, uh, uh, motivation. I'm not a motivational preacher. I just want to tell you what it takes to be saved. This new Jesus preaches a new law. The commandments of God are out, and, and any standard of godliness is rejected. It should not be a surprise, friend, when they, we see stories of them removing the Ten Commandments from the schoolhouse and the courthouse in all public places. It should not come as a surprise. Why? Because they're just being obedient to the gospel of this new Christ. Commandment of God are out. The commandments are considered more today as suggestions or ideas that we should consider. But Jesus simply plainly said in the Bible, I know him and keepeth not, he, he that saith I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Hallelujah. This new gospel that is preached by the new Christ apologizes for the standards of holiness. Apologizes. I, I'm, I'm waiting any time for somebody that's lived a holiness lifestyle to adopt the, the, the mindset of, that the world has adopted and ask the church for reparations for the years they had to suffer living a certain way and, and doing a certain thing. I'm here to tell you today I'm not going to apologize for the holiness of God. Amen. Because where there's holiness, there's reverence and there's respect. I want you to understand, friend, when there is a lack of holiness in God, and I'm not talking, I preached it just the other night, I'm not talking about the way we dress per se, but when there's an absence of holiness, there is an absence of reverence to the house of God. There is an absence of respect for the things of God that the previous generation had taught us. And for the first time in church history, for many people, the dress standards for God's house has become more immodest. It's become confusing and it has become cheap. Amen. We're no longer a peculiar people under this new gospel. We look just like the rest of them. We look just like the world. He said you are in the world but you're not of the world. He said unto them be you are in the world but you're not of this world. I want you to understand tonight there's got to be a distinct difference in the people of God. Amen. Hallelujah. People seems today are more concerned about how they would act in the governor's house or even in your house than in God's house. Hello, this new Jesus has no standard of right or wrong. I was talking to somebody at work the other day and they were talking about the things that are out of control and why it's out of control. And I said, people thought I was crazy back then. They still think I'm crazy and I keep giving them evidence to, to support their theory. Uh, but I said, I used to preach and I've preached it for years that... Uh, when there's an absence of black and white and everything starts getting gray, it's going to start breeding problems and we're seeing the fruition of the change from black and white, good and evil, and we're getting a result of what's happening in our world today is because we've lost track of what's right and what's wrong. The historic Jesus fills our hearts with reverence and an awesome fear at the very mention of his name. Hallelujah. 
this new Jesus along with the new gospel will have new music. And I don't want to spend a whole lot of time again on this, but, but, but blood songs seem to be too old-fashioned, seem to be repulsive. This new Jesus wants to be a casual friend to you. And I know the Bible says that Jesus is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. But you hear, Pastor, this morning, he is not your buddy. Hello? He is not, if he was your buddy, it would cloud his judgment. Your judgment is clouded when your best friend does something to you as opposed to a stranger. If a stranger did what your buddy does to you, you would crucify them, you would talk about them, you would do all manner of things to them. But if it was your buddy, you would think, okay, that's, that's different. I want you to understand Jesus is a brother that sticketh, he's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother, but he is not your buddy. He's not going to come down at your house and sit with you and drink coffee and talk about the, the weather and talk about deer hunting and talk about this or that. Some churches, hallelujah, are saying they want to bring the arts back to the church. They have pray. Pray. They have people that, that are dressed in robes. I've seen one video of a church. I don't know the denomination, but they had uh, probably 10 or so people dressed in white robes. I assume they, they were portraying angels, and they were just kind of swaying with the music all across the front of the building. And they say that they're returning the arts to the church. Tell me in the book of Acts, tell me in the Apolline epistles where the church had anything to do with modern arts. Hello. You see, the music prepares the emotions of these deceived worshipers to receive this new spirit, this new Jesus. I want you to understand, church, Jesus Christ still desires our worship but he will not receive worship. He will not receive anything but spiritual and anointed worship. Hallelujah. We're still required to lift holy hands to a holy God in worship. Our Jesus desires our worship. Music that is void of the blood, music that is void of the cross, Music that is void of the name of Jesus. Music that is void of redemption. Music that is void of salvation cannot and never will serve as true worship music. It is about the greatness of God. The difference between praise and worship. Praise is thanking the Lord for all he's done for you. But worship is giving him glory for who he is. New Jesus says take the cross off the wall because it's offensive. We don't want to offend anybody, preacher. You see, the truth is that it isn't sinners that are offended by the cross. It's the followers of this new Christ that is offended. The true Jesus of the church was crucified on the cross. Hallelujah. It was on the cross where your salvation and my salvation was purchased. His death decided forever that Satan had lost and had sealed his eternal defeat. The new Jesus, the new Christ is flashy. He will do things that try to stimulate your flesh and make you feel good and, and make you feel stimulated but the Bible says about the old Jesus, there is nothing flashy about him. There is nothing spectacular about the old Jesus that we preach about. Isaiah 53 and 2, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form or comeliness. When we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Uh, I want you to understand this morning, friend, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords will never stimulate or try to excite your flesh in order you order to gain your salvation. If you can't be saved because of the price that he paid at Calvary, I want you to understand you cannot be saved. 
My God, I didn't plan on preaching this hard. The word of the Lord says, Come now, let us reason together. Saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, and though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Hallelujah. The new Jesus has appeared as an angel of light. The, pro- the preachers or the, the writers of the scripture several occasions describe this new Christ, this new Jesus as a wolf in sheep's clothing. Our Redeemer never mixes a little truth with a little error. When you take an you take an oath in the courthouse of our land today, and I'm just waiting any moment for him to change that. But they will ask you, put your hand on a Bible, and they'll ask you to swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And if you're found telling a lie under oath, you are subject to perjury. You are subject to uh, you are subject to jail time and fines because you lied on the stand. If if our world today sees the importance of speaking the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, my God, why cannot we esteem, esteem or exceed that in the house of God? Hallelujah. He never mixes a little truth with a little error. He never manifests himself in spectacular nonsense. Jesus Christ, when he had his ministry, many times when he would uh, perform miracles or heal the sick, he would say, go and tell nobody that this happened to you. Don't tell nobody what's going on. Don't tell people that I healed you. He wasn't wanting the forefront. He wasn't wanting the front seat on the front row next to where everything was happening. He wanted to be in the back seat. He wanted to stand in the shadows. We sing the old song, standing somewhere in the shadows, you'll find Jesus. He said, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and they know me. I want you to understand the new Jesus is sinner friendly. Just come as you are. Jesus will accept you as you are. I want you to understand Jesus Christ understands that you're a sinner, but he will not accept you as a sinner. He'll only accept you after you repent of your sins and you get your sins washed away through the blood of Jesus Christ. Not only is this new Jesus sinner friendly, but he's also sin friendly. Nothing is to be condemned or to be rejected by the followers of this new Christ. They've coined the word tolerance. Hallelujah. I'll be branded probably by some today of being intolerant. Why is it today, though, that those that require tolerance Offer little tolerance in return. The Son of God loves the sinner. He loves you so much that he died on Calvary for your sins. And he comes to you because he loves you. He will convict you of your sin and let you understand that you can be redeemed from the sinful lifestyle. The first step Toward salvation is to understand that you're a sinner. The second step to salvation is having faith to know that he is faithful to forgive you of your sins. That he will never approach anyone in anything less than his holiness. He is not going to do you any favor letting you continue in your sinful lifestyle. It is his holiness that causes us to be smitten with guilt. It was the Apostle Paul said, if it wasn't for the law, I would thought I was a pretty good old boy. But when he understood the law, the Bible says it convicted Paul, and Paul realized that he was a sinner. There are many differences that I'm not going to preach on, Sister Carter, come, between this new Jesus and the true Jesus that we love and appreciate and serve today. 
It's with a heavy heart that I tell you today, millions of people are being deceived today. As we stand across the building this morning, Here's the problem, friend. This flesh does not have the capacity to discern between this new Jesus that comes in lies and deceiving powers. We can't, we don't have the capacity to discern. The reason being is, is that we're not as close to God as we should be or need to be or want to be. The closer you get to God, the easier it is for you to recognize false doctrine, false prophets, false teachings. We are still sheep, friend. Hello? We are still sheep, and we need to hear the voice of the shepherd. He leads us beside still waters. He takes us to green pastures. Without the shepherd... We will be deceived. We look at people and we look for people that look like us. Just because they look like us don't mean that they're like us. Because some have pulled the sheep's clothing over their, wolf, their wolves and their, their false doctrine. Jesus warned of this false or new Jesus and if he warned us of that then we should take it very seriously that they are alive and they're active in our world today I want you to understand friend hell is too hot and hell is too full of torment to spend eternity there we only have one shot in this life. Hello. Every one of us is rushing headlong to that date that we have with death. It doesn't matter whether you're young or whether you're old. I remember my pastor preaching many times and he would always use the phrase, there's just as many short graves in the cemetery as there is long graves. And I know and understand that all graves are the same size. But he was simply saying there's just as many young people in the cemetery as there is old people. As morbid as it may sound, I've always found it interesting walking through cemeteries to look at the headstones and see the date of birth and the date of death and figure in my head how old they were when they died. We only have one shot of being saved. We only have one shot of making it right. Oh, but Brother Hopkins, if I sin, I can fall on my knees in repentance. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when we take our last breath. I want to be followers of the original. I want to be followers of the original. Hallelujah. There will be many that, that have fallen to the deception of this new Christ. Saints of God, friend, let me tell you, eternity is forever. And forever is a long, long time to be lost. I said eternity is forever, and forever is a long, long time to be deceived and be lost. There's no turning back after you take your last breath. No do-overs. The false Christ may tell you it might. The false Christ may tell you that, that you have a do-over. But in the Word of God, in the Scripture, there is no do-overs there's a great gulf fixed once you get to your, your destination you can't cross over you don't get out of hell on good behavior there's no parole from that sentence God help me not to be deceived 
God, help me as a man of God not to ever attempt to deceive your people. Hallelujah. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Can we just talk to the Lord a little bit? Come on, let's talk to the Lord just a little while. In the name of Jesus Christ.